The COVID-19 lockdown measures hit the garment supply chain especially hard. With plummeting consumer demand, factory owners struggled to retain personnel. The International Labour Organization, with support from the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, were key in supporting governments to develop and implement an effective emergency program. The ILO was a natural ally and implementing partner for the BMZ. So it was only logical to commission the ILO in September 2020 with a package of measures worth 14.5 million euros for the textile sector in seven countries. On the one hand, the package included income support and employment retention measures, and on the other hand, it also incorporated occupational safety and health measures, such as trainings and guidance for risk assessment and mitigation at the workplace. To ensure that workplaces are safe production is not uh, disrupted uh, and that workers are protected from the direct and the indirect uh, health risks of COVID-19. These interventions not only helped employers retain thousands of workers, but also helped those with reduced income better meet their needs. The ILO was able to use its international social security standards to build the emergency solutions. Innovative digital platforms were developed to support delivery and outreach to workers and employers. In Cambodia, workers received training on social security using a mobile application and a specialized program on mental health was offered to relieve the stress of the pandemic. Training programs and guidelines were quickly implemented. COVID the project provided key lessons for future COVID-19 waves. First, countries need to build universal social protection system that includes everybody and includes all the branches of social security, including unemployment protection. Second, countries should create more robust systems that can scale up their support when a major crisis occurs. For ILO, social dialogue is paramount to establish social security and occupational safety and health systems. I would say that this is a quite successful example that can be replicated in even more countries. All right, Andre, you're on mute. Okay, sorry for this. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, to uh, joining us uh, this morning on this webinar. My name is Andre Picard. I'm the head of the Actual Services Unit in the Social Protection Department of the ILO in Geneva. Today, the webinar aims at reflecting on key insights and lessons learned, as well as how to move from emergency ad hoc support to sustainable long-term social protection and occupational safety and health systems. 
these will be introduced by uh, Valerie Schmidt and Mr. Uh, Joachim Pintado. Uh, they will, uh, and then we will have a, after this, a deep dive on three case studies, followed by reflection by representatives of employers and workers, as well as better work. Uh, before starting, uh, let me say special thanks to BMZ, uh, represented today by Mr. Olaf Deutschbein, head of co-head of the Sustainable uh, Supply Chain Division at BMZ, for having made this project possible. Um, you are welcome to ask questions through the Q&A channel. We will try to answer as many of them during the Q&A section. And we'll now uh, give, uh, give the floor to Valerie Schmidt, uh, Deputy Director at the Social Protection Department, as well as Rim Noor, a technical expert on social transfer, uh, also in the Social Protection Department. So uh, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Valerie and Rim. Thank you, André. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, colleagues and participants in this webinar. Um, so. Yeah, so during the, um, the COVID, so yeah, it's my pleasure to be here with you. And also um, we are really glad that uh, BMZ could participate in this webinar. And as uh, André explained, and as uh, Joachim explained also in the video, um, this project uh, has a lot of lessons learned and uh, we are really, really, it was really a successful project as well. And we are really uh, happy to be able uh, to share these lessons today with you. So uh, during the COVID-19, the, the global garment industry uh, was deeply affected uh, due to the cancellation of orders. Um, factory owners in developing countries uh, had to reduce their activity leading to part-time unemployment uh, or in some cases permanent uh, closure of, of factories. Um, in the absence of social protection measures in most of these countries, and particularly in the absence of unemployment protection, many workers uh, were left without any income support. And so this ILO BMZ project came really at the right time. Uh, with a double ambition, the first, first objective was really to support the business continuity in the global government industry, and second, uh, to provide income security to workers uh, who had lost their jobs, um, either temporarily or permanently, and had no social protection to rely on. Rim, over to you. Rim, we cannot hear you. Sorry, um, my my computer froze. We can see you. We can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Um, so the way this project was, uh, hi colleagues, uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, the way this project was implemented is really um, to, um, to, to rely or to uh, really structure its design and its implementation around uh, fully participatory um, uh, social dialogue. Um, to design and deliver tailor-made income support solutions in five countries. So the solutions uh, were different depending on the country context and depending on the social dialogue that took place between the, um, the tripartite committee that were um, put in place. Uh, for example, in, in, um, so the support component was implemented in, in five countries, namely Bangladesh, Lao, PDR, Ethiopia, Indonesia, uh, and Cambodia. In Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, it was an income support for job retention delivered uh, through uh, the regular workers' payroll. I think we will have um, the ILO Bangladesh country uh, director present the specifics of the um, of the program that was uh, approximately uh, delivered or will be delivered to 87,000 more than 87,000 workers in 160 factories. Um, and in Bangladesh, it is delivered through the business associations, um, some of the uh, two of the biggest ones in, in the country, namely BKMA and BGMA. Um, since there were no delivery systems in place, um, so these delivery systems were, um, were built uh, sort of from scratch, aligned with social security standards, 
um, with really a strong social dialogue component uh, to ensure there is inclusive, transparent, and accountable design and administration of the program. Um, in Lao PDR, which is a really interesting case because um, it's it's um, um, the country where there was a functioning unemployment insurance scheme. Uh, so the program there was an income support delivered uh, directly to workers' bank and mobile uh, money accounts, um, uh, delivered to uh, over 20,000 workers in 47 uh, factories. And the program, of course, since there are functioning systems piggybacked on existing um, Lao social security uh, organization systems and capacity, um, as well as tweak the, the, the existing unemployment insurance scheme to relax some of the eligibility criteria, uh, for example, going down from 12 months uh, of uh, contribution to only one month to be eligible for this program. Um, this, uh, this support was also paramount to strengthen systems, uh, specifically through digitalization, uh, including for the uh, payment mechanism, as well as the redress and appeal mechanism, mechanism in line with the social security standards. Um, in Ethiopia, again, we will have today um, 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 the colleague from uh, from Ethiopia uh, presenting the specific case study in uh, in our, the specifics of the program there, uh, but it was a job retention scheme that covered over fourteen thousand workers in forty six uh, factories, um, and the delivery was through uh, the Ministry of Labor. Also in Ethiopia, no uh, no delivery systems in place since there was no unemployment insurance. Um, um, and the systems were also built in place with a strong focus on digitalization, um, yet uh, remaining inclusive um, in terms of for, for those who uh, were not able to use the digital platforms by also allowing an offline process. Um, equally, social dialogue was paramount to inclusive, transparent, and accountable design and administration, uh, which, which, for example, tweaked the eligibility criteria um, once they had received feedback that um, it was difficult for factories uh, to apply with the, with the uh, many uh, criteria at the beginning. Um, in Indonesia also, there was uh, two rounds mainly to really respond quickly to the changing context in terms of both recovery, but also uh, in terms of the initial design of the program, which was a, a wage subsidy um, and a second round, which, is, which was an one-off income support. Uh, which covered ultimately more than 28,000 workers in 205 factories. Um, also no delivery systems in place, uh, despite the fact that an unemployment insurance law was passed uh, that very same year, but obviously there was no operation, uh, operational um, delivery systems in place yet. Um, or equally in Indonesia, there was the introduction of uh, digital solutions, uh, digital platform for uh, registration and eligibility criteria uh, verification, um, and this um, really this experience uh, will um, uh, the ILO will sort of um, uh, take the lessons learned from this experience to support the implementation uh, of the unemployment insurance schemes a scheme that was passed um, uh, last year. Finally, in Cambodia, um, uh, in Cambodia also. Um, uh, given the changing context in the country and also due to uh, or thanks to the social dialogue, uh, as well as the, um, the involvement of, of brands uh, also in Cambodia, there was a lot of discussions about the design and eligibility uh, or target uh, eligible groups. Um, so ultimately, it was decided for a cash for training uh, scheme um, delivered through the National Employment Agency um, and through mobile money. Uh, the training was developed by the Um, Simeon, could you put back the uh, slide, please? Thank you. Um, so the training was developed by the National Social Security Fund uh, and delivered through a mobile application. Um, there were a, over 18,000 workers in 893 factories that were covered. Um, the system piggybacked on existing systems, for example, the mobile application, uh, as well as the payment systems in Cambodia, um, where systems existed. And for those systems that didn't exist, they were built from scratch, um, including, for example, outreach and enrollment, um, which were aligned with the social security standards. Valérie, over back to you. 
Yeah, thank you, Rim. So uh, I think the, beyond uh, beyond the support uh, that this project provided to both workers and enterprises in, in the garment uh, uh, sector, the, the ILO BMZ project helped countries to put in place uh, at least four solid foundations for the development of sustainable uh, and robust uh, social protection systems. First, uh, the ILO BMZ uh, project was based on tripartite social dialogue. And this, uh, and it created really uh, social dialogue mechanisms or reinforced pre-existing ones uh, that can today be used uh, by the countries to further develop uh, their national uh, social protection systems. The second uh, building block was that the ILO BMZ project really accelerated the dig digitalization of delivery services in, uh, in countries such as Indonesia, such as Lao PDR that uh, Rim mentioned, uh, or Ethiopia, uh, which is today a, a real legacy that can be used as part of the further development uh, of their national social protection systems. A uh, third block is uh, that the project um, uh, triggered really a new interest uh, among the workers, employers and government in the development of unemployment protection uh, schemes, um, which is really, I mean, unemployment insurance is really the branch of social security that is the least developed uh, around the world. And the COVID-19 crisis has shown, and especially <laughs> through this project, we could really um, uh, see that in the absence of unemployment protection, uh, uh, workers can, can really be um, extremely vulnerable in, in the case of a crisis like COVID or any, any economic crisis. So the project really triggered a new interest around unemployment protection, and this will lead to the design of unemployment protection schemes, for instance, uh, in Bangladesh, where there are ongoing discussions, and it will also lead to the, to the as Rim explained, to the concrete implementation, it will help the concrete implementation of the unemployment uh, insurance law in Indonesia. And the last building block is that the project, uh, I mean, during the implementation, the design and implementation of the project, we really try to ensure that all 19 guiding principles of the ILO social protection floors recommendation number 202 can really be implemented uh, through the project. And uh, we were quite successful, I think. Uh, and uh, this show, shows that actually the, the, the recommendation 202 is, of course, extremely relevant when building a nationally defined social protection system and floors, but it's also relevant when you build uh, emergency responses uh, in the case of a, cr a crisis like COVID. Um, in particular, as, as mentioned already several times, the project uh, paid attention to the uh, principles such as uh, the one on the state's uh, overall responsibility, uh, the necessity of building uh, national uh, social dialogue uh, processes and mechanisms, um, the importance of inclusiveness, non-discrimination, transparency, accountability, and the development of efficient delivery mechanisms. Next slide. Uh, Valérie, yeah. if I may ask you to maybe ask, uh, accelerate a little bit because you are well above your time now, yeah. but if you could, could wrap up in the next two minutes, that would be good. Okay. Rim, do you want to say a word yeah. on social dialogue? I'm just going to say a word on, on social dialogue because it's really, um, it's, it's one of those uh, elements that is often overlooked um, in emergency responses since it's really perceived as um, possibly cumbersome, time consuming. Um, but we really thought that this, this was the foundational element that not only allowed to um, um, unlock the implementation and, and, and really ensure that the decision was um, was designed uh, by the main beneficiaries and, and the main stakeholders in, in the sector in, in general, um, but also is a foundational investment for long-term system building. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of what the, um, what the benefits of social dialogue uh, are, but um, uh, colleagues that will be presenting the case studies, uh, I think, will delve a bit more into this. Uh, but we thought this is uh, really an important point to make that uh, social dialogue is not just, um, um, is, is, not, um, is not time consuming in that sense, but really should be looked at as really an investment uh, for a human-centered recovery. Thanks. Over to you, Valerie. 
Okay, thanks, Lynn. So very quickly, uh, beyond the, the impact or the institutional changes or legacy uh, that the, the project uh, gave, uh, all these big building blocks that we mentioned, uh, it has also it had also a concrete uh, direct positive impact on workers, and uh, you will see here and in, in the video as well the testimony from this lady in Ethiopia that explains uh, how how she has used the funds uh, that she received, uh, and also there was a very interesting uh, survey conducted in Laos, a post distribution monitoring survey that explains. Uh, how the money was used, and especially the most workers uh, surveyed uh, explained that they felt uh, less stressed uh, uh, thanks to this uh, financial uh, support. Last slide. Uh, so um, I think there are emerging beyond the, you know, the institutional changes uh, and the impact on people. Uh, there are a number of lessons learned uh, from this project. Uh, the importance, of course, of building robust social protection systems, of ensuring that social protection is not only for a few, but it's universal. That social protection systems uh, uh, are resilient. Uh, they need to adapt to the, to the changing circumstances. Um, we are talking a lot about climate change demographic change, uh, multiple crises that are coming up. Um, the fourth lesson uh, learned is that uh, social protection systems around the world are insufficiently financed. It's very important uh, to, um, to invest more in national social protection systems from, of course, uh, the government side uh, through uh, budgets, uh, I mean, uh, uh, tax finance, social protection, but also from workers and employers contributions. Um, a fifth lesson learned, as mentioned several times already, that is that social dialogue uh, is a must. Uh, it's, it's through social dialogue that you can build uh, sustainable solutions uh, based on a national consensus. Um, and last point is that, of course, uh, in the absence of social protection, um, people are extremely vulnerable uh, and uh, that uh, to, to really uh, increase uh, social protection coverage, improve social protection for people, uh, you cannot do it uh, by working only uh, in the silo of social protection. You really need to link uh, social protection policies with other, um, uh, other policies related to the formalization, uh, uh, using also um, uh, the labor, labor inspection, et cetera. So many, many, many other complementing policies can help you uh, to develop a national social protection systems that cover all. So these are the main lessons learned from this project and that help us also, of course, uh, to build um, uh, to, to build and to, to, to progress in our, in our support to many more countries. Thank you, over to you, André. Thank you, Valérie. Uh, I will have now to, in all fairness, maybe give the same time to Joachim, but Joachim, in the interest of time, if you could uh, respect your uh, seven, eight minutes that we gave you, it will help. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. I will try shortly. So uh, first of all, let me say that uh, uh, and highlight that one outcome for us of this project, uh, in addition to uh, what we obtained at country level, was also the excellent collaboration we had with the Social Protection Department, Better Work, and of course, country, country offices. Uh, let me just focus on, well, first of all, tell you what was the the focus of the project when it came to occupational safety and health, and then I'll also highlight some lessons learned and you know things that we may do uh, in the in the future. You know, as we have learned many things with, with the project, uh, indeed. So the the, the other component of, of the project had, let us say, two main objectives. One uh, was to, pr to provide uh, immediate support to workplaces as they are not prepared to um, to deal uh, with a health emergency that uh, we all went through uh, when you know we got the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So this direct assistance to, uh, to workplaces consisted very much of assisting them to effectively manage uh, the direct risks uh, related to uh, SARS-CoV-2. And again, the direct risks would be uh, in terms of outbreaks and infection, but also not forgetting that the other risks, all the other risks, risks were still there. Uh, and even when implementing uh, preventive or control measures addressing the infection risk related to SARS-CoV-2, uh, this could also bring up, you know, uncontrolled risks that we would need to, uh, you know, identify, assess, and, and, and control as well. 
the other uh, focus of the project was, of course, looking more into uh, the institutional side of what we would need to do uh, in every country, not only to um, uh, assist constitu constituents in terms of developing the most adequate policies to address the other dimension of the crisis, but also preparing for the future and for future, namely for future health crises that potentially, uh, you know, will be with us, uh, hopefully not, but potentially will be with us in, in, uh, in the in the future. So the coverage uh, uh, in terms of countries uh, were, so uh, um, our Vision, Vision Zero Fund teams uh, implemented directly the project in Ethiopia, Laos and Madagascar. And then uh, we also uh, took advantage of the fact that uh, better work is present in many countries, also to work with our colleagues from better work uh, to uh, implement uh, both these practical measures at workplace level, but also uh, to uh, assist constituents uh, at uh, institutional level in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Indonesia and Vietnam. I will ask you to show us the, the second slide, please. Uh, so to go a bit more in detail on what uh, our interventions uh, uh, consist of. So the direct support uh, in countries uh, went, again, as I said before, uh, from assist uh, uh, to, to workplaces, from assisting them to uh, correctly manage uh, indirect and direct risks, but also to things that uh, we uh, would not potentially expect from an analog project to do because we would think that that would be a need that would be covered, but even the provision of PPE is in some places, it was not evident that uh, PPE were available to, to the factories. And of course, we all know that this is the last element, the last option when it comes to, uh, to uh, OSH preventive measures, but still when, when, uh, when, it, uh, when we have to deal with biological hazards, it is certainly one important piece of uh, the, the solutions that we have to put in place. The other one was uh, also building the capacities of tripartite constituents. So of national authorities, of employers and employees organizations and of workers on again, how to identify the needs of each workplace and the needs of the sector in general in terms of addressing uh, the OSH problems caused by, caused by, by the pandemic uh, also very much from a uh, perspective of immediate response, so emergency preparedness, but also in terms of preparing for the future. Uh, the uh, third uh, subcomponent of the OSH component was on awareness raising, and let us say, you know, educating people, so going well beyond the workplaces on what to do to prevent infection from COVID-19, but also addressing the mental health dimension of the of this uh, of the pandemic, which was quite heavy uh, for many, many workers, of course, and many employers. Uh, and uh, finally, also, of course, we cannot uh, um, work uh, effectively in the countries without, as Valerie said, uh, building up and strengthening social dialogue mechanisms and institutions. So this was a very important part of our, uh, of our approach to uh, be sure that, you know, in every single country, uh, chapter type actors were involved in formulating uh, policy responses, but also at workplace level that we had the, the involvement of workers' representatives, either through watch committees, safety delegates, so it depends very much on how this looked like in every single and different workplace. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would say that one of the um, not a lesson learned, because this is something that we uh, have been doing uh, you know, with the visit that projects in general, but one of the key elements uh, for success was the fact that immediately uh, we engaged with the constituents on a rapid needs assessment. Uh, again, in terms of addressing the immediate needs that we had at national sectorial, sectoral and, and workplace level, but also then looking into the, you know, mid to longer term needs and all the interventions that we have implemented at the country level or as a matter of fact, the result of the needs assessment that, that we, we carried out uh, quite quickly uh, when the project has, has started. Then uh, one uh, also other important element that I think that contributed to the su success of the, problem, of the project was the fact that it was highly decentralized and it was very flexible. And flexibility here was key because as you all know, we all uh, went through and are still going through the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, workplaces need to adapt on a constant basis. And again, answers in terms of preventing and controlling uh, occupational hazards related to COVID-19 also needed to adapt constantly to the needs that workplaces you know, will have. 
uh, mainly to comply with national directives on uh, on COVID-19, as we all get to do, for example, in our ILO offices. So the same applied to to uh, to these workplaces, uh, knowing also that some of the workplaces, especially uh, workplaces where we had you know a big concentration of workers, the risk namely the direct risk of infection, of course, would be higher than in other, in other settings. Then uh, the, uh, what I would highlight also in terms of a, a major key uh, for successful interventions was the fostering uh, collaboration between the different authorities in countries that had a, a role to play in terms of COVID-19. And this was problematic uh, I'm not referring now to the countries of the project, but it was problematic in many uh, places because labor and health authorities was, were not always uh, uh, coordinated in their uh, uh, answers, policy answers and policy responses and, and action. Uh, and uh, workers, workplaces, communities were sometimes hearing messages that were not consistent. And sometimes we saw that the messaging uh, addressing public health was not the messaging that would be the most adequate when it comes to occupational safety and health. And we had to play an important role here in terms of ensuring that the messages going out from the different national authorities were consistent and not forgetting that the approaches to public health are not necessarily the same as the approaches to, uh, to, um, to occupational safety and health. Next slide, please. So the key achievements also in terms of concrete results. Uh, so uh, we supported, the project supported uh, over 2,600 factories in terms of direct support measures. There was also awareness raising. Uh, we reached uh, around 4, 3 million workers, families and community, very much also in what relates to education in terms of how to protect themselves and their families and their communities against the risks of, uh, of, of infection with, with the virus. Uh, we uh, did uh, uh, deliver uh, PPE uh, kits, so personal protective equi equipment uh, kits to uh, almost uh, every single uh, workplace. Uh, we assisted uh, uh, also more than 150 factories to comply with national guidelines on uh, COVID-19 and develop their own uh, action plans in terms of responding to the, to the, to the emergency. Uh, and we, build, we have built the capacities, uh, again, um, a wide, um, let's say, group of institutions from uh, occupational health services, again, a, a very big deficit in many countries where the country has operated that needs to be addressed in the longer term, uh, lab inspectorates, and of course also at workplace level, employers management and OSH committees and, and, say, and workers representatives. Next one, please. So in terms of also uh, results, uh, what I would highlight was the fact that the project did develop uh, many different tools, practical tools that are usable outside of the project. And as a matter of fact, many of them were even globalized and used in countries and regions where the project was not operating. So that was quite, was quite positive. Again, it helped to strengthen, uh, uh, let's say national coordination between different authorities that maybe has helped to uh, build a bridge that will stay for the future. And again, because we see more and more, and Valerie uh, mentioned uh, climate change, we see more and more than to respond to upcoming OSH challenges. We cannot separate uh, the health dimension from the OSH dimension. So we need necessarily the coordinated action of at least, at least these two uh, national segments of government. Uh, of course, the fact that uh, uh, we um, have um, worked very well uh, with uh, better colleagues, and of course, this is something that uh, hopefully uh, will also build up in terms of uh, future projects and future action at, at country level. And again, one of the things that I would highlight as probably one of the best results of the project is that OSH became a, a centerpiece of policy debate at national, sectorial, and also workplace level, and there wasn't a single workplace that didn't understand the need of preventing and protecting the health and safety of the workers as a condition for business sustainability. So I'd ask you the next slide, please. Uh, exactly. So um, I'll just get it very brief. So uh, I think it was the previous one. Uh, sorry. 
Okay, so I'll just get it brief briefly then. So uh, uh, we organized uh, uh, webinars at country level by the end of last year. And again, the uh, I'd say that the, the conclusions of these webinars are not different from what we obtained from other countries where you know the branch, uh, the ILO has, has operated. And again, uh, it, it comes uh, um, uh, once, uh, once again to the, to the fact that when we, we are dealing with a public health emergency, uh, we need to remain flexible. We need to remain flexible in the ILO. Uh, we need to remain uh, flexible when it comes to national authorities and workplaces need to remain uh, flexible. So one of the, let us say, uh, lessons learned, uh, but at, at the same time as well, uh, an outcome of the project is that uh, we were able to see that there was a constant need of adapting the responses, both uh, at institutional level, but very much at workplace level in terms of addressing the changing needs that workplace, workplaces had in terms of uh, preventing uh, contagion, uh, also addressing other dimensions of the pandemic, again, you know, in terms of mental health, but also very much uh, other hazards that uh, um, came along uh, or uh, were emphasized by the fact that we were, for example, using uh, more uh, disinfectants in workplaces. And of course, this comes also with a risk in terms of exposure to uh, hazardous chemical substances. So this is something that I think uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic helped workplaces to realize something that the ILO is advocating for many, many years, that when you address uh, OSH, you have to do it in a systemic way. And either, even if you have a priority uh, that needs to be, that you, know, you need to focus on, and on this case, you know, the risk of infection, you cannot forget that uh, you will never have an adequate response to preventing and mitigating your OSH hazards if you don't look into this into the system as a whole. So this, I think, you know, this understanding uh, by workplaces was also quite a positive result uh, from our end. I will finish here and I'll give you back the floor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joachim. I forgot to mention when I uh, give you the floor that you are also the, the you are the chief of the labor in, labor administration, labor inspection, and occupational safety and health branch, uh, what we, that we call it the ILO lab admin OSH. So now uh, we are entering into the country case studies. So uh, we will start with Bangladesh, and I will give the floor to Tuomo uh, Putianin, who is the director of the ILO Bangladesh country office. Over to you. Uh, Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss with you today. I think there is a very short PowerPoint that we can um, shoot off. Maybe we go straight to the third slide, the impact of COVID-19. Um, thanks. So obviously, no surprise to anyone that uh, as one of the biggest or, or maybe the biggest uh, sort of uh, uh, garment producing country, the industry was very occupied and concerned when the crisis hits uh, on, on, on what will happen, right? And um, uh, it was, it was uh, really uh, important that uh, the ILO and the other organizations that were, were interested in helping were able to very promptly commence discussions with the constituents and the industry on how that help would possibly look like. Let's go to the next one already. Uh, I think the impact is sort of uh, pretty well known. So first of all, uh, I think the, uh, in, the government took it very seriously and they put together a very big sort of a support program of their own in terms of concessional loans and in terms of subventions to the industry. Um, but as that took some time to get going, also the developmental partners moved in to provide sort of uh, with a, with a, with a urgency, provide also financial uh, sort of assistance in this space. And here you have, uh, and I mentioned particularly quite a significant EU and, um, and German government, a KFW related fund, which is sort of a, a bit over hundred million uh, that was uh, committed to this course. And also the, uh, this PMZ initiative that we are here talking about sort of forms part of, uh, of a similar assistance um, uh, uh, and put forward as explained by the colleagues uh, through a, a different kind of a, a modality. So that was the context. We must also remember that the industry is massive in terms of its salary needs. We are talking about 400 to 450 million US dollars per month, right? 
So whatever the government and whatever the developmental partners were able to put forward, uh, you know, it, it really is, uh, was, was in many, may, in, in, in certain sense, relatively speaking, small amounts of money, but still very, very important uh, when targeted uh, well. So let's go to the next slide in terms of uh, why this program in particular sort of mattered, right? First of all, it, it's the program where, uh, the only program, where the workers and the employers together with the government together were able to discuss the deployment of the fund and the prioritization of the fund. So what the colleagues were earlier say, saying, the sort of the social dialogue for coming together happened mostly through this exercise, not through some of the other uh, initiatives that I, I mentioned. Secondly, this particular fund was, uh, was particularly directed to the smaller players in the industry. This, those players that are not as bankable, that don't have uh, as a good relationship with the brands and buyers to sort of uh, come from the COVID quicker. And, uh, and that uh, from the very early stages of the discussions that we had was always the priority for the workers, for the government and for the employers to try to support the, the smaller players who are hurt the most in relation to this, uh, uh, to this uh, industry. And while the, the fund is relatively small, we're talking about 3,000 taka uh, in terms of the, the uh, one-time payment, it was still perceived and conceived as important for those players, those, those small players. So there's a certain uh, sort of a, a enhanced uh, alertness to the fact that while it's big industry, like big, big uh, resources are required for the recovery, this type of a targeted support for the smaller players can and, uh, and, and, and is playing an important sort of a part in terms of uh, assisting the, the industry. And currently uh, it is a one-time subsidy, right? And uh, uh, the, the, what was said earlier, we, cre we, we decided that the best and most effective way to deploy this fund is through the industry associations themselves. The government or originally was of the opinion that they would like to see it channeled through the government systems, but due to the administrative sort of uh, complications and also expectations in terms of uh, not being able to provide this in a timely and targeted manner, at the end of the day, it was decided that the best way to pursue this is really through, through uh, the industry associations. And the Employers Federation, who I believe is also present today, was also very supportive of this, uh, this approach. Let's go to the next one. Uh, yeah, so what, what is the scale? Well, it's uh, 200 to 500 uh, uh, worker factories, so the small ones. It is through BGMA and BKMA and through their kind of pre-vetting and validation of their, uh, of their members who would be eligible to this but then also checked by the TRAPA, that constituents, Ministry of Labor and the, and the, and the Worker Party, that the, the criteria and the application of the fund is properly, properly set. Next one, please. So here, endorsed by industry partners, uh, approximately a little bit less than 100,000 workers, perhaps 80,000 workers, around 200 factories that uh, could be uh, part of it. And it's really about employment retention. So it's a partial payment through their payroll. And that was also important because uh, one of the reasons why we wanted it to go through BGM and BKMA was to not to confuse the workers that there's some extra payment. No, it's, it's blended in into the, while recognizing that there is support, it's blended into the payroll of the, of the factories. So those were the kind of key considerations that we, um, we had uh, at the time. And maybe the last one. Last slide, I can recall lessons learned. Yeah, so uh, uh, engagement with the partners. This was not a very easy process or a very easy general uh, sort of uh, implementation of this fund. It actually took us uh, way too long and uh, it took some considerable efforts to sort of deploy the financing, not because the idea wasn't solid, but due to, due to the, the government financial systems 
and the acceptance of the funds. So we went almost down to the wire to the last minute to be able to actually deploy the fund. Um, the, 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 I think the most important thing, aside from the support for the sustainability of the businesses and also for the income security, I think the most important uh, issue that we were able to sort of achieve with this program is generally the lessons learned about the shortcomings in relation to the social protection systems and also how this kind of emergency financing uh, uh, is actually very difficult to deploy in, uh, in uh, speedily and in a targeted manner in the current sort of environment of uh, aid and, uh, and managing these kind of initiatives in, in, in Bangladesh. At the same time, and lastly, I think uh, the most important, uh, one of the second most important thing is that this program and other initiatives in this space uh, have created a, a, a very fruitful environment to continue to reflect and to build forward fuller social protection systems, including aimed at um, employment uh, protection and also in included in terms of building sort of the resiliency of the, of the industries such as the garment sector, if there were to be similar crises in the future. So I fully heartedly sort of thank the BMZ for the opportunity to have this program, because I think it really has raised some important uh, forward looking uh, opportunities to discuss how a modern social protection system, including this type of uh, emergency uh, financing uh, should look like and could look like uh, for the purposes of, uh, of Bangladesh. And I'll, I'll stop here because I know there are other countries who wish to present and I have colleagues online who will be able to explain a bit more thoroughly the ins and outs of the programs if there are, are questions. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Tuomo. Uh, now it uh, will turn the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Kedis Chala, uh, who is the head of the ILO Apparel and Textile, textile Program uh, in the Ethiopia country office. So over to you, uh, Kedis. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andre. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, colleagues. Um, in Ethiopia, the garment and textile industry is a new in or emerging industry, uh, unlike uh, Bangladesh. Uh, next slide, please. So the industry was heavily affected uh, by COVID, but just to give you a context, there are around over 200 garment and textile factories operating in the country. And the government policy for structural transformation and making a private sector as a driver uh, of the economy was based on making sure that the garment industry is up and running. Uh, during COVID, uh, a number of partners were uh, trying to come up with a program because the impact was uh, immense. Um, as you can see, the government did um, uh, an assessment, and we also, as ILO, conducted an assessment uh, of all the factories that we are working with to understand uh, the impact. So it's, it, it's reducing the GDP growth uh, by 4%. And the impact was felt not only in manufacturing, but also service and construction uh, sector, which are also linked to the, the garment sector. So uh, since some of the factories are starting very early, uh, the impact was immense because you know, they don't have that business linkage or uh, the marketing side, uh, which is which helped them to, uh, to continue with uh, COVID. And in Ethiopia, the industry is known for paying low wages. And with the surge of inflation, uh, majority of workers and their families were at the, at the risk of going, uh, you know, or falling into uh, deep poverty. Uh, to address this, a number of development partners uh, using even ILO study uh, developed a package. So notably BMZ, uh, FCDO, uh, and the COVID response was targeting only the FDI or exporting factories. And in the absence of um, unemployment insurance, it was very difficult even for them to process, but we could see that uh, the local manufacturers, which are which with limited resource and you know uh, income and uh, profit, were uh, completely neglected. So uh, our focus, in coordination with 
uh, other development partners and tripartite partners was to focus on the domestic uh, manufacturers. Next slide, please. So the objective of the program is, uh, you know, to secure income uh, and uh, while supporting the industry uh, to continue operating. Uh, and once uh, economic activities are uh, resuming, they will be in a position to uh, start the uh, production. So the benefit package was, uh, you know, the basic salary, uh, you know, eligible, wor eligible uh, workers, and also in uh, factories were given basic uh, salary income, and the benefit depends on the salary of each and every uh, workers. So we work very closely with government, uh, namely Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, the private social security agency, and our social partners, workers and employers, and other sectoral associations. At the beginning, it was very difficult to bring them on board and also discuss uh, it's on a weekly basis. So to structure our conversation and also uh, the collaboration, we established steering committee and also technical working group. Uh, and the technical working group and was doing the day-to-day -day work in terms of making sure that the eligibility criteria is finalized and what kind of delivery system uh, will be put in place while the steering committee was providing us their uh, guidance. As part of the delivery system, we developed a web portal. As I said earlier, there is no system, so we had to uh, start from scratch. And the web portal, um, I don't know how many of you are aware, Ethiopia is a very big country with 110 million. And if with movement restriction due to COVID, if we have only an option for the factories to submit their application uh, offline, will be limiting or will be discriminating some of the factories which are located far from the cities. So as a result, we put a web, web portal system for some of the enterprises which are unable to uh, register. We work with Ministry of Industry and the Sectoral Association and also our program supporting them uh, in the uh, registration. And as part of the process and having the tripartite plus structure, um, in the, the Syrian committee, we had a number of dialogue about unemployment insurance in Ethiopia. And that debate really helped us to uh, even submit a position paper to the prime minister office and uh, to have the high level discussion with the social security board. And the social dialogue element, which was labor intensive at the beginning, was paying off as we move along the uh, operation. So we covered, uh, uh, we covered around, uh, uh, we covered around uh, 46 factories and which employs over 14,000 uh, workers. Next slide, please. So, you know, the major results is reducing layoff and ensure business continuity. This is key because in Ethiopia immediately after COVID, there was the civil conflict, which was putting a lot of burden on the economy. Uh, so uh, having this cushion helped the industry to move. Uh, and some of the factories which were supported by our program were the most disadvantaged ones, like you know, uh, enterprise employing persons with disability. So if they didn't have that income, uh, finding alternative uh, jobs would have been uh, difficult or nearly impossible. And we helped as part of the program to build system, not only at the factory level, but at the national level. For example, some of the factories were not paying a salary uh, through the banking system. So um, one of the requirements was to make sure that workers open uh, bank accounts. Uh, another eligibility criteria were later to all factories should pay their uh, private uh, pension obligations. So that also helped uh, the patient authority to be on top of uh, the, uh, their uh, collection. Social dialogue uh, mentioned earlier, but at the center of our uh, intervention. From the get-go, we relied on the tripartite uh, partners engagement in all aspects of the decision-making from naming of the program uh, uh, 
um, and naming of the web portal and all the way to finalizing the eligibility criteria and uh, benefit package. And we provided active role to social partners and government. So they were part and parcel of the program rather than just providing, uh, providing uh, guidance. Um, well, as we move along the implementation, some of the eligibility criteria were uh, difficult. So all these parties were sitting together uh, in uh, making sure that it's applicable. And that really created and facilitated uh, collaboration and trust among uh, the partners. At the enterprise level, you know, uh, basic trade unions and management have to work together to make sure that the, the submissions were completed. And at the, at the national level, in all the decision makings were not only with our traditional uh, tripartite plus partners, but other uh, sectoral associations, which were uh, not usually meeting on a regular basis. And we created the sense of urgency to develop an employment insurance scheme. It was evident that you know, we struggled at the beginning uh, in developing system because the system doesn't exist. So the government and um, tripartite plus partners immediately develop a project document to strengthen the social protection system as a whole. Next, please. So what did we learn? So the major thing we learned is social dialogue is essential for design and implementing social protection system. So yes, we could have started implementing it with government or workers or employers organization, but it wouldn't have given us the result we're having uh, now. So um, from the get-go, having our tripartite plus partners involved help us to, help us to achieve um, uh, and respond to the emergency, uh, but also think about the future in holistic manner. And there should be continuous advocacy and support to develop strong and robust social protection system. The government and social partners are aware that there is a need uh, to develop uh, social protection or revise the existing social protection policy. Uh, uh, so uh, the project document is developed. So we are at the stage of mobilizing resource. So the emergency program is now helping us to look beyond uh, COVID. Luckily, Ethiopia is included in both the income support and the occupational safety and health. So it helped us to respond to COVID in a holistic manner. It would have been very difficult or the workers wouldn't have felt comfortable to work in, uh, in a factory if there is no COVID uh, uh, prevention or system. And if the government is not supported to respond to COVID in a comprehensive manner. So having both, helped us uh, to really move uh, swiftly. Uh, broad partnership allowed us to, uh, to have better outreach and communication. So as I said earlier, our factories are located all over the place. So working with uh, government, unions, and um, uh, sectoral association, as well as employers organization, uh, coupled with using uh, public mass media helped us to uh, have better uh, outreach. Um, let me stop here and I'll be very happy uh, to respond to uh, any questions. Thank you so much. Over to you, Andre. Thank you very much, Kedis. Uh, it was uh, very interesting. Um, now I will uh, turn the floor to uh, for the uh, case of Madagascar to Bernafo Andege, who is project officer at the ILO Madagascar country office. So uh, uh, Bernard, the floor is yours. Okay, Andre, thank you. Uh, please, the next slide. So uh, as you, you just said, I will share uh, some experience from Madagascar case. Just in terms of uh, background uh, in Madagascar, besides the insertion mode of the project in 2017, we have been working in free uh, sector but since the, the second phase of the project, we are working in the textile and the construction sector. So regarding the, the COVID-19 uh, com com component, we, we've start, we focus mostly in the, the, the textile sector, but uh, we have been able to expand our activity in other sectors such as uh, the construction, 
the project mainly target approximately more than uh, 300 uh, workers in the two um, in the textile and the construction sector. Uh, next slide, please. So um, when the, the pandemic started in Madagascar in March uh, 2020, the, the, project, the project was already uh, uh, being implemented, but we received uh, several requests from uh, uh, social partner and the government as well to, to support the, the, effort, the effort in terms of uh, COVID-19 response. So uh, we took uh, this opportunity to support the government and probably notably by uh, supporting the ratification of the Free ILOCO uh, OSH Convention and also to support the revision of the, the national labor law. And uh, these have been very uh, useful because uh, we realized that uh, all the, the, the partner, including the, at the institutional level and from the social partner part, uh, perspective, they, they, they request the, the support of the project to, uh, to strengthen in general the, 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 the national uh, OSH legal framework regarding OSH and also to align the provision with the, what is recommended in the, the free convention that I just mentioned before. And for, for example, now in the, the new labor code, which is, is, been, um, is under approval, uh, approval at the government level, uh, the, the, there are some uh, provi uh, provis provisions such as uh, the, the need or, or the obligation for any employers uh, to establish and uh, implement emergency, emergency preparedness uh, and a response plan. And this also take into consideration both uh, OSH and other emergency that can um, can occur or can appear in the in the future. So, uh, in terms of, of lesson, we realized that um, during the pandemic uh, or the COVID nineteen pandemic gave in for the Madagascar case the opportunity to rethink how the uh, the, the national uh, OSH framework have been designed and we, we have been able to improve the, the the provision and to anticipate in case of. Um, uh, or other crises will come, and so that there will not be the need to rethink or to revise again the um, again the, the labor code. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. Also, during the before the um, the pandemic, uh, Madagascar there was uh, several um, issue regarding the institutional capacity of uh, all the particularly the labor inspector. And as you are probably aware, in 2018, the, the project in Madagascar supported the government in putting in place a, a task force of a labor inspector. So during the pandemic, this uh, task force have been uh, very, very useful in the way that the project supports the, the task force in designing and implementing a, a strategic uh, uh, compliance plan, which practically support uh, more than 113 uh, textile uh, company in uh, responding and ensuring that uh, both OSH measure and COVID-19 measure was uh, uh, kept in place. And this have also been very useful in, in the way that the, those companies have been able to ensure the continuity of, of their activity and is really, really reduce the, the social and economic impact of, of, of the COVID-19. We also realize that when we, uh, we support labor inspectorate, we are able to better coordinate the, the intervention of uh, OSHA provide um, OSHA support function, for example, occupational health services, for example, social security fund, labor inspector have been able to take uh, the, the lead and to coordinate all action, uh, aiming to, to, to build a culture of prevention at the workplace level. So it sounds the, uh, with the BNZ fund and in general with the, the BZD fund in Madagascar in general, we have been able to strengthen the coordination of, uh, uh, of uh, OSHA support function. And we also realized that these kind of initiatives are, um, are very welcomed by employers in the way that you will not have labor inspe inspector who will come on Monday and then the occupational health services who will come on Tuesday. So uh, employers also welcome this kind of coordination, uh, coordinate uh, initiative that also reduce the the the, the, the duplication of uh, uh, and a repetition of intervention or control at the at the workplace level. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, now uh, I think for in the case of many uh, other country in Madagascar, uh, there was a so, uh, so social partner in general really uh, lacked uh, capacity in terms of, for example, the, when we were working with um, workers organization, they, they didn't have a, a, a good understanding of uh, OSH issue in general. Of course, they, they knew which kind of, um, uh, of risk are at their workplace level, but they really miss uh, a, a sound on the, uh, understanding of uh, OSH issue. It was the same at uh, the employer's uh, organization. At this was limited their capacity to, to, to contribute of uh, a national OSH, uh, national initiative aiming to, to improve OSH and to build a culture of, of prevention. So with BMZ project, we, we have been able to work in general to, to, to strengthen capacity of both employers and workers uh, on the organization on OSH and also on COVID-19 issue. Now in Madagascar, if for example, we take a GFP, GFP who is one of the big uh, employers organization, the, organ the, 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 the organization have been able to put in place a, a OSH commission who is, who is now able to, 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 to participate in all um, initiative organizing in Madagascar and with the purpose to improve OSH. And also the, we have been able to, to support the, the, the setup of a, a pool of competencies is around 10 person who are member of uh, who, who work uh, as a uh, specialist within company member of GFP and who is uh, providing or developing and implementing uh, OSHA, OSHA so support uh, services. And as I said be before, we have also been able to, to support um, uh, workers organization in strengthening their capacity, strengthening their knowledge on in, uh, in OSH issue and general and COVID-19 as well. And now when, for example, uh, I talked before about the, the revision of labor court, both uh, workers organization and um, employers organization have been able to better uh, contribute in the, the revision of uh, labor court because now they better understand what is the, the, the importance of uh, assessing risk at the workplace level, what is it important to have a, a prevention plan. So they are now better equipped to uh, to provide a technical uh, contribution. And this is very uh, helpful if we, re we really want to build a, a culture of prevention at the, uh, at the workplace level and also at the national level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the, um, uh, the, the, the work that the project is also uh, achieving is to, uh, is, uh, build a um, partnership to, with a um, uh, national institution in, in order to strengthen the, the uh, OSH education in general for its sustainability. Before the project, uh, and in Madagascar, I have to say there is not really a school or a training institution which provides um, uh, uh, recognized training on OSH. So now the project uh, builds a uh, strong um, uh, partnership with, for example, National School of Administration, who is uh, which uh, train a labor inspector, uh, inspectorate, and also the National School of uh, Magistrates and Clerk of Madagascar. Now the OSH in general and COVID-19, of course, because we are working on the, on the two components, are being integrated as part of the, 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 the training module and curricula. And we, we think with this uh, strategy, we will be able to, uh, to, to have a a better of understand, understanding and consideration of OSH um, at, the, at the national level in Madagascar. The project is still working to establish other uh, uh, pa partnership, for example, with, with WHO to work in uh, occupational um, uh, on uh, health issue and also with TVET uh, institution and occupational physician uh, training institute. The, the, the purpose is really to build this uh, general um, a general knowledge regarding OSH issue in general. And uh, we are also working with uh, uh, training a institution in general or school to, to, to really integrate OSH at the all, the, all level of, um, of, uh, of education. And it's very important to also note that the, the private sector is really playing a key role of, um, in, in um, 
in uh, building this uh, general uh, education in um, in osh so if i have to summarize in terms of uh, lesson learned uh, we realized that even the, the pandemic had um, a economic and social impact in general but for the case in madagascar it has been seen an uh, an opportunity to rethink the both the institutional and the the the, the normative uh, framework uh, uh, regarding osh in, Mar in madagascar that also why we took the advantage uh, to to support the revision of the labor code we have also realized that a better coordination amongst uh, na national institution is very helpful to bring all those all the actors together to to harmonize their, their practice to develop tools because in the case of madagascar we, we have developed several tools for example for labor inspector who are which are now used by um, both at the national at the, the regional level for example to to conduct uh, uh, inspection visit at the workplace to, to conduct uh, awareness campaign so this coordination is very useful both for the at the institutional level but is also very welcome by by employers and workers as the at the workplace level we also uh, realized that working closely with a social partner strengthening their knowledge their capacity is uh, useful to uh, enable them to better contribute to all the uh, initiatives that are planned or uh, implemented at the national level, at the sectorial level, at the workplace level. So it's really, really important if we really want, or if we are thinking to build a, a, a culture of prevention, it's important to work closely with social partners, but also to strengthen their own capacity so that they will be able to better contribute to any initiative that, were, that would be organized at the workplace level. So those are some, uh, uh, uh information that uh, we have planned to to share with you for uh, madagascar, madagascar case thank you over to you thank thank you bernard uh, i just remind uh, you that if you want uh, the, the people the listening if you want to uh, ask question um uh, don't hesitate to go on the uh, q a uh, section of the webinar and uh, you can ask your question we will after uh, the uh, the next this next section on the so reaction of social partners we will get to a, a q a uh, section so now we get to the section on the reaction of the uh, social partners we will start with um, we were supposed to in the agenda to start with uh, farouk ahmed from the bangladesh employer federation but it seems that we are having a problem uh, uh, to have him connecting, but so, so we'll, um, if you don't mind, Alison, to start, uh, we'll start with you, and maybe we'll be able to uh, reach uh, Mr. Hamid uh, uh, while you are presenting. Okay, if I, over to you, um, Alison. Uh, Alison, I have to mention that she's Director of Economic and Social Policy at the International Trade Union Confederation. Over to you. Andre, thank you so much for inviting me to be able to respond to, as a constituent of the ILO and as uh, unions are great supporters of universal social protection. And indeed, we hope by June also that occupational health and safety will be included as a fundamental principle and right of work. I'm a little sorry that Farouk is not on the call now because some of my messages are indeed for him uh, in Bangladesh, but we will take it up at another time, I'm sure. The comments I have to make are um, three. I really want to acknowledge the importance of the coordination between social protection, occupational health and safety, labor rights and employment protection measures. And this project is really important to show that not only is it possible, but that we need to be doing much more to ensure that is the case um, across in terms of the coordination of different aspects of the ILO, but in countries where we are not just focusing on issues around employment retention or access to social protection, but all these elements are important to bring together. So I would really start by saying that social protection and indeed occupational health and safety have been fundamental to sustain people around the world throughout the COVID-19 crisis which I might add, we are, it's far from over. We have many, many workers who remain without work. 
who have reduced hours of work uh, are existing on lower incomes prior to the beginning of COVID, as we know, and many, many others who are still suffering from dealing with COVID, both in their own health and their family's health, without access to benefits like sick leave, paid sick leave, or indeed care. So social protection in all its elements is acknowledged not only in the instruments that we have, uh, Valerie mentioned, so Convention 102 and Recommendation 202, and the importance of the ILO's leadership in demonstrating that that provides a systemic foundation for building national social protection systems. But we also have social protection acknowledged in the ILO's global call to action for a human-centered recovery to COVID-19, but that it is inclusive, it's sustainable, and it's resilient. So what we have learned from this project is how important these elements are in an emergency response moment, but that we hope that this will be taken up as a priority for investment for the future, not only by the ILO, but by the sister UN agencies and others, including donor governments. So I'm really going to address a number of issues around rights, around the funding gaps, the financing gaps that we see, and, um, and link, I hope, to um, what Farouk might like to respond to if he can join the call. So really the importance of um, the ILO's work, I thank all the colleagues on the call for the work that you do in your countries. What we know is that the building of and effective dialogue processes between workers through our unions and employers and governments is essential to building responsive national social protection systems. And as other speakers have said, we see that this project serves as, as an important first step, but much more is needed to ensure that all the elements of Recommendation 202 of the social protection floor are fulfilled. It was mentioned that in some places the delivery systems were strengthened because they did not exist before COVID. And we know that this is really essential for not only anticipating future crises, but building resilience, whether those crises are in relation to health or economic crisis with the disruption of, of business and supply chains, or indeed climate crisis, which we know is coming, it is here indeed. So the delivery systems for social protection are essential to be accountable. It's been mentioned already to be transparent and to be inclusive. And so we know that donor governments have learned through this process where they invest donor funds, we need to have those social partner relationships and dialogue processes strong and strong labor market institutions that can manage, that can plan, that can anticipate and can implement effectively. So the social dialogue that has been referred to by many of the speakers, frankly, doesn't exist in very meaningful ways in some countries. We know that the ILO's work is essential as a convener and as a space for ensuring that that dialogue can happen and that both social protection and other labor protections, including the payment of minimum wages, ensuring that that is a reality, as well as addressing issues around gender discrimination and many other elements that are so relevant to this conversation, actually happen and that it is not something that um, governments can delay on. Having these dialogue processes in place has de been demonstrated through this project to deliver effective and time relevant responses. Now, I would say that on the financing front, although the importance of social protection is Growingly, it's, it's recognized it by many institutions. We are still facing enormous financing gaps. The ILO, which plays a fundamental role in social protection, both because of its tripartite nature, but also because of its great technical uh, advice and support, 
The ILO has shown that the financing gaps to establish social protection flaws in the world's poorest countries is actually close to 78 billion US dollars. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but actually the statistics are very clear that in 2020, whilst the share of overseas development assistance increased to 2.7% of total ODA, which accounts for about 5.6 billion US dollars, up from a mere 1.3% in 2019 before the COVID crisis hit, then this is still woefully inadequate. Ah, great, Farouk is here, hello. And what I wanted to really emphasize is that closing the financial gap will require not only international coordination for the delivery of effective technical support and financial support, but mobilizing domestic resources through taxes, through social security contributions is also important. So coordination between donors, which have a strong role to play in supporting developing countries in setting up and consolidating national social protection systems. So whilst we've heard quite a bit about the garment industry and indeed construction, agriculture in some other cases in, um, in the countries that have been presented today. As trade unions, we consider that coordinated approaches to social protection is really fundamental at the national level and indeed where I can contribute from the ITUC's perspective where, where we can um, also help mobilize and support our affiliates at national level, but for global conversations. So I really appreciate the opportunity to reflect on um, the country examples today, but I wanted to give a little bit of um, a note to ILO colleagues around the world on the financing gaps question, because we see that social protection should be seen as a social and economic investment. And more and more companies through the brands and the suppliers are also seeing how this is important to ensure business continuity, business sustainability. The ITUC has undertaken research that has shown that investments in social protection can yield nearly twice their value in economic returns. Investing in social protection boosts employment. As has been heard before, it supports employment retention. That is that workers, when there has been disruptions to work, can return to work or indeed have their contracts respected. Social protection also contributes to, of course, just, just transition measures in relation to climate action and the transfer, the deployment or redeployment and reskilling of workers as workplaces and industries must change and transform. Social protection contributes to skills development, to productivity, indeed to demand for goods and services and can foster overall GDP. So Farouk, as you're here, I'm going to give the case example of Bangladesh from our um, research, from the ITUC research. So a recent simulation conducted for us showed that increasing social spending by 1% of GDP alone would lead to a 13% reduction in poverty and a 1.9% increase in tax revenue and a 1.5% increase in GDP. So this is actually offsetting the increased costs and leading to increased benefits. So the conversation now and this project that um, has been described this morning or today rather, wherever you are in the world, I'm sorry, we need to see that the technical and financial assistance to extend social protection is more readily available in more countries to be able to reach more workers. And that the commitment of overseas development assistance, as well as the linkage between labor rights, we do not see, and this is my final point, Andre, we, we know that social dialogue, whether it's with occupational health and safety committees or workers' councils, trade unions provide a foundation for ensuring that those rights are respected of freedom of association, 
and collective bargaining. And we know that the independence and effective functioning of trade union bodies as committees and as unions at workplace or federation or national level are essential to fulfilling and protecting the rights of workers. If I might make a closing point on the link between social protection and wages and freedom of association. We have seen in many countries during COVID where safety provisions have not been respected, where workers have taken to assemble or protest or indeed strike. We've seen police brutality and violence against workers to suppress those strikes, to suppress their rightful demand for wages to be paid or payments of wages to be made on time, including in export processing zones. So the freedom of association is really essential as a protection for workers' rights more broadly, but including for occupational health and safety and social protection. So if we are to say that social dialogue is meaningful, we know that, as our colleague from Madagascar said, we need to build a culture of safety and of prevention. We need to build a culture, colleagues, of respect, of rights, and of dignity at work. And this is a really an opportunity to invest in that and ensure that this is available for all workers universally. And my final point is that universality is understood by many people in many different contexts. And this is a message also to many of the international financial institutions, the World Bank and others included. Two thirds of funding to social protection globally, two thirds of the ODA that is directed to social protection comes from the World Bank. But they do not actually respect universality as we understand it as a fundamental human right. Targeted social protection or indeed time limited cash transfers do not meet the standard of fundamental human rights and do not meet the needs for investing in long term contribution to building social protection systems. So we really do need to be learning from each other and turning to those that have the technical expertise that show that emergency solutions can be a part of the beginning of um, building national social protection systems that will build resilience and protect workers and support business in the longer term. I hope that meets some of the expectations of, of colleagues around the world because we understand that building those systems in a national context very much depends on your own national needs and priorities. But we really thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Alison, and, and I will uh, retain your trick to um, go over your time is having many last points. That's good, that's good. <laughs> I'm gonna keep that one. Um, now we'll uh, turn the floor to uh, Mr. Farouk Ahmed, who is the Secretary General of the Bangladesh Employers Federation, that we had a bit difficulty to, uh, we had, didn't have the, the right email, so now we, we managed to uh, connect him. So Farouk, the floor is yours. and colleagues. Uh, first of all, uh, I, am, uh, I would say that I'm lucky that finally I could get the WhatsApp message from Andre and then I could be connected uh, because this is an issue. It lies in my heart, to be very frank and honest. Uh, unfortunately, some of the other, uh, I haven't received a, a single mail on this particular issue. So it's absolutely an extempore on my part uh, to deliver whatever that I would I like to. Uh, anyway, uh, but then uh, uh, still, uh, I'm, I'm thankful and grateful to you that uh, uh, you uh, uh, sent me a, a WhatsApp message and then I could be connected. Um, social protection is certainly extremely important for any country, undoubtedly, and particularly the COVID-19 has taught us uh, through a practical lesson, I would say rather, uh, perhaps before the COVID, uh, uh, if I ask, if I say about my feeling, uh, working as the uh, Secretary General of the Employers Federation, 
uh, and uh, occupying the chair for about nearly about two decades. Uh, to be very frank and honest, the issue really did not strike my mind so seriously as it is now, particularly the lessons that we have been taught through the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, and uh, I, would, I would rather uh, 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 strongly propose that each and every country must undertake a, uh, an extremely uh, a methodical step in terms of uh, catering for social protection uh, of its uh, citizens, uh, uh, undertaking a pilot project, which Bangladesh at the moment, since we did not have anything uh, sustainable system, we have a sort of uh, insurance uh, coverage program, but those are not sustainable programs in terms of uh, longer term basis, uh, which is very much needed. Uh, but uh, and then uh, after the, uh, particularly taking the example of Rana Plaza and then followed by COVID-19, uh, it has uh, appeared to us uh, in a uh, much more significant manner to issue the uh, to address the issue uh, in the most uh, uh, urgent way, uh, so that uh, 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 such sort of uneventuality, such sort of uncertainties, which the world is passing through now, uh, 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 can be mitigated uh, as uh, easily as possible. Um, and I personally feel that uh, uh, there, there should be some structural changes in the overall uh, budgetary uh, uh, allocation system in each and every country, particularly the labor intensive countries like Bangladesh, uh, where uh, it, uh, the, the issue of social protection should be made uh, from the very root level uh, with a longer term plan involving the stakeholders, uh, both uh, the uh, workers, employers, of course, the government being in the uh, leading role. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, the contributions must come uh, from all the stakeholders, uh, including the uh, development partners. Uh, we are also grateful to ILO and also to ITUC uh, uh, to, uh, and, and, and certainly uh, on the German, German government, of course, uh, that uh, through your initiative, through your, uh, I would say, guidance and technical advice, we have been able to, at least in Bangladesh, we have been uh, uh, able to come to a state where uh, uh, a lion part of the business community, particularly the leaders, those who matter, those who influence the decisions, uh, especially in the, in the garment sector, somehow or other, uh, they have been uh, I would say they have been compelled to be motivated. They have been compelled to be motivated uh, to take the idea of introducing a social protection system. Uh, as of now, uh, we are we are progressing in a phase wise. Currently, on a piloting basis, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, an, an interim arrangement. Uh, the pilot uh, is almost on the verge of uh, uh, have, having a formal launching. But necessary groundworks are almost completed. Uh, maybe we'll be able to formally launch uh, very, very soon. And the pilot is for five years uh, 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 period, five years uh, time. And the coverage for data collection purpose, the coverage will be for 150 uh, workers uh, and covering uh, uh, as many uh, number of enterprises in the, in the garment sector in provisionally. But certainly we do have in our mind to have uh, something in place in a bigger way at national level, incorporating gradually in a progressive manner all the sectors uh, 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 under, under, under that particular uh, coverage. And uh, uh, definitely it's, uh, uh, there, is, there is no further debate of the requirement of, of this particular uh, uh, in instrument having in place in each and every country, uh, which uh, uh, would uh, definitely uh, uh, give uh, some bit of cushion period in, term, in, in case of emergencies, uncertainties. 
and um, uh, as we had been expecting uh, better days uh, during the post covid era and we had, as we have been hearing the now artificial uh, crisis uh, that is going on in europe and ukraine has created another uh, havoc uh, uh, to to us and it has created tremendous uh, i would say uh, challenges and crises uh, in terms of uh, in, the, in almost in every field though it's not directly impacting uh, uh, loss of jobs but the uh, 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 there has been a, a, a stalemate in terms of manufacturing activities uh, in the particularly in terms of maintaining the supply chain uh, and also in the financial uh, market uh, there has been uh, lots of uncertainties going on you have you, you might have you, are, you, you might have said uh, in the uh, newspapers uh, that there has been uh, uncertainties in terms of foreign exchange rate uh, it has shot up like anything uh, so all those challenges are in fact multiplying uh, in moving forward so under such circumstances uh, it uh, uh, certainly uh, um, it's absolutely clear to us to the policy makers now uh, that we need to work together for which ilo is providing the necessary uh, platform for us uh, and the german government also uh, supporting us accordingly ituc also uh, time and again guiding us cautioning us uh, and uh, uh, certainly uh, creating some sort of a uh, psychological compulsion for for us on the part of the employer uh, to engage uh, in a more uh, uh, serious manner on this particular issue uh, so uh, uh, i i would prolong uh, any more uh, i can i can uh, uh, reiterate the assurance of the commitment of the employers in bangladesh maybe it might take little time but then uh, uh, definitely we are we are with it and we will certainly uh, move forward uh, one uh, uh, a point just to just to uh, uh, mention that during the time of extreme crisis uh, we have been able to uh, somehow or other we have been able to look after our workers with the support of the government with the financial packages that the government uh, declared uh, we have been able to support maybe one or two cases where uh, there has been some sort of mismanagement but then in nutshell in general uh, we have been able to uh, continue our operation maybe at a lower, lower uh, scale at a lower capacity uh, but then now uh, covid situation is uh, about to be over but other artificial crisis i don't want to repeat uh, so let's see let's uh, look for a better future and also we we are very much uh, committed and we look forward to your further support guidance and assistance uh, thank you very much thank you uh, farooq and uh, I'm, I'm glad that we finally managed to uh, to reach you that so that you could participate uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are running uh, quite late. We are 35 minutes uh, uh, above the time that we had planned. Uh, now we would uh, be to the uh, question and answer uh, section of uh, our webinar. Uh, I don't see any uh, question in the question and, uh, and answer uh, section. Uh, but uh, if you have a question, uh, uh, I guess you can still send your question or if we have questions from our uh, panelists, uh, uh, you can also ask questions. Maybe we can take you just a few minutes. And after this, I would uh, uh, maybe also Mr. Uh, Deutsch Bain from uh, BMZ, if you would like to say a few words uh, on the part of BMZ, uh, maybe it would be the time for you to, uh, to take the floor. Uh, I don't know if you have anything that you want, would like to say. Okay. Uh, uh, Andre, yeah, can I can I raise a question? It's Valerie. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a question um, for Alison. Uh, so thanks a lot huh, for the your amazing statements, and it was clear and yeah. 
Um, on the financing gap, of course, it is a very, very important issue, uh, but of course, not the only bottleneck, of course, to, to achieve universal social protection. You were mentioning that the World Bank uh, represents two thirds of the ODA uh, for, for social protection. So there is clearly um, an important um, work ahead of us to, to try to, to ensure that uh, these investments in social protection actually uh, are aligned uh, with the principles that you were uh, mentioning, the recommendation 202. Uh, so that the, the countries with the World Bank loans can really start developing sustainable social protection systems that cover all and not um, temporary safety nets. But beyond the World Bank, do you think, uh, how, how do you think that we should work um, towards also other, other investments, other public development banks? There is a coalition for social investments, for instance, um, and, uh, and, and the private sector in general. Uh, to convince them, as you rightly said, that social protection is, is um, an investment with a high return. So how can we make the link between what the evidence and the interests uh, of those who are um, who could uh, invest and in, uh, in supporting countries in developing their national sustainable social protection systems? Thank you. Andre, I will try to answer fast. <laughs> uh, it's a big question, and I could take a longer time, but a shorter reply, I think, is that we really need, as Farouk has demonstrated, a serious conversation at national level that governments themselves are aligning um, the actors in their own national economies, whether they be international actors in support or um, national actors at the forefront, first and foremost. And um, it is, of course, different in each country, so hence my uh, way of responding to this. I think there is for sure the need to have good technical support. And, and I, again, acknowledge the role that the ILO plays as the lead agency to do that. Um, the point of having sufficient finance is really one of political will, I would say. And what we have seen, um, the remaining uh, third of support internationally to social protection from ODA beyond the World Bank's um, mostly uh, loans, not grants, I might add. So there's a much bigger issue for developing countries in dealing with their own debt sustainability or debt relief measures. And this is an important area of macroeconomic policy that has to be coordinated seriously at the international level. Debt itself is a crisis. We see in the context of Sri Lanka, for example, and that is only one of many countries. But I think that um, if we look at where the OECD Development Assistance Committee work is looking at social protection needs, for example, nine of those donor governments have doubled or tripled their contributions um, as a result of uh, the, the pandemic. So especially, and I acknowledge Germany and France and Sweden, but what we see is that those bilateral relationships as important and as effective as they can be, we know that if we're going to address issues like the pandemic globally, we need to ensure a social protection floor in all of the poorest countries and support those countries dealing with huge debt crises to be able to still invest in the most meaningful investments for social and economic returns, and that is social protection as a floor. And, um, and so I would just add that the discussions that happen at national level with those multilateral development banks, with business, um, there is the, the pilot project that the ILO is supporting in bridging solutions, for example, to address um, employment insurance and employment um, related, um, help me, Andre, my brain's gone. Uh, employment I'm, injury, employment injury thank schemes. You, injury is the word wouldn't come to my mind, thank you. So not only in the case of uh, paid sick leave, but also compensation for injury at work, let alone fundamental issues around access for maternity provision, etc. So workplace dynamics are um, 
what we have seen is that it's not only those involved in work from a formal employment perspective, but many, many, many more workers in informal work. Also, we know need to access fundamental social protection uh, and to have their rights fulfilled. So it's really essential that we look at coordination mechanisms and we know that the United Nations Secretary General's commitment on the accelerator for jobs and social protection gives us an opportunity to bring many of those actors together. And, and for those who are not aware, the ITC has been advocating for many years and we are very happy to hear the German Development Minister, for example, engage with us last week at the Labour 7 Summit under the G7 auspices, uh, committing also to um, support for the Global Social Protection Fund, a financing and technical mechanism to coordinate. So we are still far from actually having that be implemented and have all the um, actors at the table, but I think there is really broad understanding that this is a step that needs to be taken to ensure that there's coherence and sufficient financing. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. And uh, in order not to lose too many people uh, and to end uh, our uh, our work webinar today, I would uh, now give the floor to uh, Rupa, my colleague Rupa from the Better Work Program to have the perspective of the Better Work Program that has been very helpful in implementing uh, both components of this uh, uh, of this uh, project. So Rupa, floor is yours. Thank you, Andre. Um, thank you everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share some reflections at the end of this very important event. Better Work um, was very actively involved in implementing both the OSH and social protection elements of this program. And I have to say the partnership and collaboration with uh, the Vision Zero Fund, with uh, Ray Bradman Osh, the social protection has really been excellent. So I also thank the BNZ for um, allowing this opportunity and this focus on, on some very important work. Um, I'll talk very briefly about the role of Better Work. I know we're over time and then go into some observations and, and maybe some um, areas of focus for the future. So Better Work, um, because we work at a garment manufacturer level and work in close partnership with constituents and global brands and retailers, we were really able to repurpose our program infrastructure and our human resources to very quickly support project implementation in terms of OSH, um, with Vision Zero Fund working on uh, supporting constituents to design and implement very practical workplace prevention measures on uh, supporting the capacity building of risk assessments, emergency preparedness, capacity building and awareness raising for workers with workers representatives to, to raise awareness to the pandemic on health and hygiene, on mental health, um, as well as facilitating tripartite dialogue on OSH policies and how they could be strengthened for future crises or uh, pandemics and, and epidemic, epidemics. And on the social protection side, we worked with uh, the social protection department on implementing income replacement schemes as well as helping to convene engagement with constituents and global brands and retailers on social protection priorities. And a third area um, which was connected, this work was connected to was the IOE ITC industrial call to action which focused on a COVID response in the garment sector and better work along with social protection and others in the ILO supported the convening of that call to action. So maybe I'll just highlight a couple of observations from our side that I think some of them are reinforcing what's already been said that uh, I'll make five uh, quick points. So one is that the pandemic really brought to the forefront the fundamental importance of social protection, strong social protection systems and strong OSH systems um, to protect workers, employers, and to ensure resilience in jobs and firm at a firm level. Um, we saw the devastating impact and immediate impact that the collapse in demand for clothing had on the sector and on workers, um, with millions of workers, particularly women furloughed, suffering income loss, suffering um, a loss of jobs, as we've heard from others. And this, as Farouk mentioned, really, I think, made um, 
much, much more important uh, social protection systems and strengthening them and OSH policies. And this, it has to be an essential focus for recovery and resilience in the future. Two, in terms of social dialogue, we really saw that the pandemic demonstrated how essential social dialogue was in developing priorities and plans to strengthen social protection. We helped in the convening of conversations on joint prioritization of OSH um, issues during the pandemic. Also uh, with the social protection department and through the call to action, um, convened social partners and global social partners, um, national social partners, uh, global brands and retailers in prioritizing short and long-term social protection. And I think that's really uh, the next step around that. It's, it's really sort of brought forward a new agenda and a new impetus on social protection. And the next step, as Allison said, is, is really ensuring that we find the right financing, but also um, means to support implementation of these plans that have been developed. My third point is really that the crisis, it's a little bit of a different point, but the crisis shot, uh, really shines a light on the role of different actors in developing social protection systems. And we, Allison touched on um, a number of these points, but um, it also, it, it, I wanted to draw on the point of how it really also highlighted the role that brands and retailers can play. Um, a number of critics pointed to the cancellation of orders as being a cause of and the use of force majeure contracts to cancel orders um, as really depriving the sector of really badly needed liquidity. Um, and I think, again, through the call to action, which was connected to, to this work, um, it really highlighted, it was, the, I think, the first time that there was a conversation around the different roles actors could play in developing social protection systems. Um, including brands and retailers. And this was really not a conversation that, that we've had with different constituents and stakeholders. And so some of those included brands and retailers acknowledging that social protection um, contributions are not just legally required, but that they are a um, investment by those employers into their workforce and into business continuity, that brands and retailers can play a role in ensuring and supporting suppliers to comply with legal requirements, ensuring workers are registered, that those payments are made, including through um, their own private monitoring schemes. Um, and lastly, as we touched on, there's a role that they can be playing um, where, where social protection systems are particularly weak um, in terms of other alternative approaches, temporary approaches, such as bridging solutions that we've heard talked about, and they can work with tripartite organizations, the ILO, on identifying that, appro that sort of uh, appropriate financing um, that can really support um, while national systems are being strengthened and while um, the building of national finance tripartite solutions takes place. Um, my last point is also tied a little bit to, to something different, but I think there's real importance uh, in terms of the relationship between human rights due diligence and the support for the implementation of social protection systems. At Better Work, we know that the monitoring and implementation of um, laws to provide social security or health uh, benefits or in, uh, employment injury insurance is, is really important for achieving a level playing field. Um, more systematic uh, work can be done through the due diligence of government companies, but work has to be done to really raise awareness to the importance of compliance with these issues. Um, we've seen that when we share that data with constituents, it really shines a spotlight on issues. For example, in Haiti, um, we learned through our monitoring that um, employers don't have a lot of trust in the local institutions or concerns around transparency, around the efficiency, um, and, and putting that conversation uh, on the table for the constituents really supported um, greater uh, employer advocacy for stronger institutions and a plan for strengthening social protection in, in the country. And my last point is really just uh, that collaboration is essential. I, I started my comments by saying that the, that the, the internal uh, collaboration within the ILO um, was, was extremely, uh, well done very well and you know and I think the work that was done also with the global social partners the national constituents the global brands that's essential because this these challenges are complex they're unprecedented uh, it requires unprecedented 
partnerships. And I think the momentum of that kind of dialogue and partnership and collaboration shouldn't be shouldn't be lost, but should be enhanced. And we should really build on the social dialogue platforms that were heavily drawn upon during this crisis as we uh, we continue to, to face it and face new crisis crises um, and build uh, towards a, a, a better a better resilient um, future. And I'll turn it back to you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rupa. Uh, I will try now to um, conclude very briefly. Uh, when I um, I've uh, I've listened to all the interventions today, there are maybe three words that come to my mind. Uh, that these three words are opportunity, preparedness, and social dialogue. Uh, opportunity, because uh, uh, although nobody wishes for uh, having crisis. But crises are inevitable. Uh, we had crisis, and we will have more crisis in the future. It may we may have even more crisis in the future. Uh, but uh, we e each crisis uh, offers our most crisis offers opportunity, and uh, opportunity for social protection is uh, what we've seen. And it's not the first time that ILO is uh, being involved in emergency support. Rana Plaza was mentioned. There was also Tazrin Fire also in Bangladesh. There was the Ali, uh, the Ali Enterprise Baldia factory also in Pakistan. In each of these cases, uh, ILO was there to uh, support on and uh, for emergency support. And these were uh, at the same time, we were opportunity uh, to start social dialogue on it, establishing uh, well, I mean, would say long-term sustainable solutions. Uh, and uh, it was mentioned that in Bangladesh, uh, now we will be uh, um, starting launching soon this pilot on employment injury bridging solutions. Uh, should be should be should start very soon, as was mentioned by by Farouk. Uh, and uh, and each time uh, we are that has allowed this. I mean, allowed also ILO to learn and improve our ability to respond better, faster, and also in line with social security uh, principles and standards. Uh, preparedness is because, I mean, the, these experiences have also showed that for a timely and more adequate response, there is a need to build a better a resilient system, uh, which are better addressed ex ante or prior to crisis, uh, as well as to have preparedness measures, including to, uh, through prior consultations among social partner and social security institution. In the case of this project, uh, the country that was able to deliver uh, most rapidly was Lao PDR, where they already had in place social security institution that had our, that was offering unemployment insurance benefit. So uh, we, it is the country where we were able to proceed most rapidly. Uh, and social dialogue. This is a, a this is a, uh, something that we heard in all presentations today. Um, I mean, the, the only way to uh, uh, to put in place a system, a social insurance or social protection system, in a sustainable manner is through social dialogue. And this is why um, the social protection uh, department. Uh, together with uh, uh, our colleagues from the uh, Bureau of Activity of Employers, Bureau of Activity of, uh, of Workers, also uh, with, the, uh, with the Better Work Program, we will increase our collaborative work in order to strengthen the capacity of social partners and tripartite structures to, um, to improve or uh, strengthen social dialogues in, uh, at the national level. So uh, thank you everybody for uh, your participation today. And if you have any other questions, you can also visit our, uh, our the web pages that were uh, shared by Valérie and uh, Joachim during the presentation today. You can find there a lot of information on the uh, this uh, BMZ funded uh, program. Thank you everybody. Have a good afternoon. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.